Enter the MSI Cyborg 15 A13V, a brand new laptop design never seen before from MSI. But considering it's $1000, is it really that worth it? We'll later compare it to a similar spec PC and find out if it is. But its standout feature is a super thin design, coming in at 0.9 inches thick, which makes the laptop pretty sleek. It's also flanked by its 1.98 kilogram weight. They've also integrated the nice translucent design that we've come accustomed to on MSI laptops, which we also saw in the MSI GT77HX. This design also extends to the keyboard area, but we'll touch more on the actual keyboard a bit later. I think it's a very edgy and sleek design that stands out from the crowd, with its edgy gamer text even extending to the bottom vents. Thankfully, lid flex is very minimal thanks to the metal design that they included on the laptop lid. However, for those RGB aficionados out there, be prepared to be disappointed. Because the only RGB this has is the light up keyboard, which only lights up blue. I guess you could say it still includes the B of the RGB. For this price point, it's acceptable, but some may find the lack of RGB pretty disappointing. Overall, for its price range, I'd say it stands out from the crowd, while still somehow being very minimal in my opinion. Which is odd to say considering its ample gamer text and translucent plastic all around. Much like its design, the ports are pretty minimal as well. In my opinion, they should have put most of the ports on the back of the laptop, as most of the ports are on the, each of the sides. As the back of the laptop is mostly just plastic, with a single vent. Starting on the left side, you get a single USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, and a headphone microphone combo jack. While on the right side, you get a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A port, a USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C that also supports DisplayPort, a HDMI 2.1 port, an RJ45 Ethernet port, and lastly DCN. Overall, it's a decent amount of ports, but it's definitely not winning any ports awards, with only two Type-A ports, and only a single Type-C port that isn't even Thunderbolt. Now let's talk about the keyboard and trackpad. In my opinion, the trackpad felt fine, with pretty nice clickers. As usual, it supports Windows Precision Touchpad, which means I had no trouble using it for basic tasks like browsing the web. Also, its larger than usual size meant that there was plenty of room for her activities. The keyboard as well was pretty decent in my opinion. I didn't have any problems with the key trouble and it was a pleasure to type on, with decent enough feedback when pressed, coming from a chiclet keyboard. The display on the other hand is your decent affair of 144Hz goodness at 1080p, might I add. Its IPS technology means you can get great viewing angles, which I can confirm and it's generally good for gaming. As we'll see later, this laptop can easily get above the 144Hz refresh rate most of the time. But talking about color reproduction is where I found it a bit lacking. I found it to have quite dull colors, which don't get me wrong is perfect for gaming, but if you're planning on doing any content creation like photo or video editing, then this laptop won't be for you. On top of that, I also found the max brightness of this display was pretty damn low. I don't have any equipment to test the laptop, on its display, but stay tuned for future videos as hopefully in the near future we'll have that. I also found the laptop's lack of a mock switch was pretty disappointing and might disappoint a few people as well, as the laptop offers no ability to switch the dedicated GPU to the main display, which means if you're looking for an edge in latency and performance from the GPU, then this isn't for you. Overall, I would say it's decent enough for casual gaming, with its 144Hz refresh rate providing ample smoothness in some of your favourite titles. But if you're planning on doing any colour accurate work, such as photo or video editing, then you might want to reconsider. Now if you bought this laptop expecting it to have a good webcam microphone, prepare to be disappointed. It's only a mere 720p 30fps webcam, which as with most laptops, has barely any resemblance of colour or detail. I also found the fact that they made the webcam light flash a little distracting, as it constantly blinks whenever you're recording. The microphone wasn't much better either, I guess it's decent enough for your standard zoom calls. But I found the audio quality to have lots of background noise and what sounded like electronic noise. The speakers, although they're a dual setup, sound better than I expected, with lots of bass, clear midtones, and decent vocals. Despite the elevated bass, you can still hear the vocals well enough. Take a listen. Next, let's get into the technical side with some power and thermal testing. Running Spider-Man Remastered at 10 minutes 
the i7-13620H averages 38.95 watts, while the RTX 4050 averages 31.07 watts. You can see the CPU and GPU effectively managing the power budget in this game, as when the CPU starts to throttle, the GPU ends up increasing its wattage to maintain great gaming performance. Moving over to CPU temperature and clock while gaming, across all the P cores in the i7-13620H, it averages a clock of 3791MHz, so it did end up thermal throttling. Across all the E cores, it averages a clock of 2707.83MHz, so thermal throttles. Overall, the CPU package temperature ends up being 85 degrees, which considering the thermal setup of this laptop isn't surprising. But compared to the Nitro 5 we reviewed, it's a night and day difference even though this only has one fan, compared to two fans on the Nitro 5. The GPU temperature and clock while gaming was a lot more stable, with the GPU averaging a core clock of 1888 MHz, while the memory stayed at a relative 1413.82 MHz, with the GPU core average temperature only getting around 69 degrees. Nice. While in a lengthy Cinebench run at 10 minutes, the i7-13620H averages 50 watts, and looking at the CPU temperature and clock, the p cores averaged a core clock speed of 3344.73 MHz, while thermal throttle, while the e cores on the other hand averaged a clock speed of 2639.15 watts, while also thermal throttle. This time around, while in Cinebench, the CPU package averaged a temperature of 90.25 degrees Celsius, Again, to be expected, considering the thermal setup, but still is a lot better than the Nitro 5, even while under heavy loads. Now looking at the thermal design for this laptop, we took it apart to see what the heat pipes looked like inside, and between the GPU and the CPU, there's a shared heat pipe, with an extra heat pipe for a total of 3 heat pipes. That's a lot of heat pipes. Not really. The biggest noticeable factor is that there's only a single fan that cools both the CPU and the GPU. While well, it's quite a large fan, it might have been better for MSI to just put two fans and add more surface area for the heat pipes to distribute the heat, as only two fin stacks surround the single fan. The CPU's main heat pipe, however, does distribute the heat along the phase setup for the GPU. Since it's a single fan setup as well, it can get quite loud. Take a listen. Overall, it's a quite limited cooling setup, all things considered which could have been improved by adding another fan and putting in a larger surface area for the fin stacks. This would have created a more balanced cooling setup, but given the price of the machine, maybe it was justified to go along with this cooling setup. But issues of thermal throttling, even during gaming, do raise some concerns. Next, let's take a look at upgrade options. The first thing that you'll notice is that there's no glory holes, so removing the entire back panel is required. Taking off the back panel reveals pretty lackluster upgradability. For starters, there's no additional M.2 slot, with there only being one for the included 512GB SSD. But what's surprising is that there's solder pads for an additional slot next to the Wi-Fi card. In my opinion, MSI just should have added another M.2 slot, considering that there's solder pads there. Another gripe that I have is that the RAM slots are covered by a metal cover, which isn't a huge deal, but what I have a problem with is that it doesn't dissipate heat and just acts like an insulator as there's no thermal interface material to be seen. Taking that off, with some added struggle might I add, reveals that both slots are populated with 8GB each for a total of 16GB. And while that might be a great thing for performance, as dual channel all the way, don't get me wrong, for upgradability, it's not so much, since you could have easily added another 16GB if there was a single 16GB stick already installed. I guess it's a good thing, as it's not soldered to the motherboard at least. Still though, I'm kinda surprised how they managed to fit two RAM slots, given how thin this laptop is. Overall, it's pretty lackluster upgradability, means that if you're into upgrading your stuff down the line, be prepared to be disappointed. Now let's get into the battery life. Overall, battery life was pretty decent, at least not for gaming. Using the PCMark battery life suite in idle battery, it lasts around 7 hours and 3 minutes, while in video playback it lasts 6 hours and 14 minutes. In modern office, it lasts 6 hours and 3 minutes, while in application battery, it lasts 5 hours and 18 minutes. Lastly, in gaming, it lasts around 1 hour and 19 minutes. Just before we head into the benchmarks of this machine, let's look at the specs. As you already know, it comes with the 13th generation Intel Core i7 13620H, which is basically an i7-12650H, but with slightly higher clocks, with 6 p cores and 4 e cores for a total of 10 cores and 16 threads. 
you get plenty of cores in this price range. For memory, you get 16 GB of DDR5 RAM running at 5200 mega transfers, which is pretty decent and faster than what you get in most laptops. For the GPU, you get the run-of-the-mill RTX 4050 mobile, only coming in with a measly 6 GB of VRAM, which definitely won't be winning any GPU races anytime soon, but it's decent enough for the price range. And last but not least, you get a 512GB NVMe drive. Now finally, let's get into the benchmarks of this machine. In the Puget Adobe Suite, it falls behind the Acer Nitro 5 in Photoshop and After Effects, likely due to its less powerful 4050 GPU versus the RTX 4060 and the Nitro 5. However, the biggest hit is in Premiere Pro, as the MSI Cyborg 15 even falls back to the Acer Swift X. In UOL Procyon Office Suite, the MSI Cyborg 15 leads the Nitro 5 and the Triton 500 in Word, while falling behind in Excel and PowerPoint. In Blender, the Cyborg 15 ends up being toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Nitro 5 in Classroom, but it does slightly edge past the Nitro in the BMW scene by 2%. In the Chromium Code Compiled, sadly, the MSI Cyborg 15 ends up being the slowest in Chromium Code Compiled, where even the Swift X takes a 31% lead and the Nitro 5 is 22% faster than the Cyborg. Pretty disappointing, if you ask me. In Cinemench R23, the Cyborg 15 continues to struggle against the Nitro 5, with that performing 12% better. However, it does manage an edge over the MSI GE76 by 10% in multi-core. In single core, on the other hand, the Cyborg 15 is less than a percent better than the Nitro, while the GE76 outpaces the Cyborg by 9%. In 3D Mark, the 4050 in the Cyborg 15 ends up being third last, with the Nitro 5 edging past in Time Swipe by 48%, and in Wildlife by 52% against the Cyborg. 3D Mark Storage paints an interesting story, with the Cyborg 15 ending up being in the middle of the chart, or the Nitro 5 edges past it by 38%, following the GE76 and Triton 500 which outperformed it by 30 and 35% respectively. Now let's look at gaming performance. Now I'm not going to go too in depth in terms of numbers, as you can see gameplay on screen right now. In CS2 at the lowest settings, we're getting above 200 FPS, which is good enough for this esports heavy title and is blazing above the 144Hz refresh rate of the display. So in hindsight, you're getting a really great experience. In Cyberpunk 2077 at the low ray tracing preset, with frame generation on, RAID reconstruction on and DLSS set the balance. We're seeing above 50 FPS, which isn't the best, but considering the 4050 in this laptop, it's no slouch either. And the frame generation definitely helps it. Now in another competitive title, Rainbow Six Siege, at the lowest settings with no anti-aliasing, we're seeing around 230 FPS, which is no surprise for a game this easy to run. It means you're getting an ultra smooth experience, with no stutters, and you're getting way above the 144Hz refresh rate. Now in a bit more of an intensive title, in Spider-Man Remastered at the medium preset, again with frame generation on and DLSS set the balance, we're seeing a surprising result of 110 FPS. I did notice that the gameplay was a bit stuttery. I'm not sure why that is, maybe it's due to frame generation? It's still a decent experience nonetheless. For those motor enthusiasts out there in Forza Motorsport, a high dynamic render quality with DLSS balance, we're seeing around 78 FPS, which I wasn't expecting at high dynamic render quality and shows how well optimized Motorsport is. It was a very decent and playable experience and was really smooth even though we weren't getting 144 FPS all the time. So that's the MSI Cyborg 15. Is it perfect? Not really. It's not a perfect laptop, especially considering its cooling setup. But what it is, is it's a slim and sleek laptop that will certainly turn heads with its edgy and unique design. While it doesn't have the best performance, it blends the world of gaming with portability, and that's something that I really liked about the laptop. The notable drawbacks, like its display and its performance due to the thermals, are hard to overlook. But for the price, I'll definitely say it's worth it. But if you're looking for more bang for your buck, definitely consider building a PC as that'll give you more performance and upgradability. We actually picked out a PC which you can see on screen. It includes a more powerful i5-13500 which has 14 cores instead of 10. And in the same price bracket we managed to get a 1TB SSD and a 4060Ti. And also since we're using a 700 series motherboard, you're easily able to drop in a 14th generation CPU if you so choose. And also since there's 4 RAM slots, you're able to easily upgrade the RAM. 
So in terms of performance per dollar, I would say get the PC. But if you're into portability and you like the idea of taking your games on the go, then the laptop's for you. Ultimately, it depends on what your preferences are. And that about wraps up our review. Make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Also make sure to check out this video on the screen right now.